Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode. We're going to do a Bible study today on Jesus as bridegroom, king, and judge. Right now in our culture, in America, things are crazy. There are issues, there's injustices, there is rebellion, there's lawlessness, there's all kinds of struggles and challenges. And I believe what we need, not just uh, for the world, but for the church is a revelation of who Jesus is. And what we see in the scriptures is as we near the return of Jesus, that he's going to begin to reveal himself in these distinct ways as a bridegroom, as a king, and as a judge. And we need a revelation of that. And it actually helps confront the deception and the sinfulness that's not only in the world right now, but in the church. And it's also going to give us marching orders and clarity in what we need to do with our life in order to be in sync with God and what he's doing in this season right now. So I'm excited to dive into the scriptures today with you in this Bible study. But before I do, I just want to welcome you. If you're new to the Presence Pioneers podcast, thank you for joining us. We exist to equip presence-centered communities to worship and pray night and day. We believe God's presence changes everything. And so we want to see communities established that are hosting God's presence night and day. So we're here for you. If you're a part of a burn community or a house of prayer or a prayer group or a church that's passionate about worship and revival in the presence of God, we're here for you. And we want to equip you and encourage you. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet. Uh, if you're if you're tuning in on Apple, please give us a rating and a review. That helps us a lot. And you can always visit our website at presencepioneers.org. We've got information about our ministry. You can subscribe via email there, which is my personal favorite. You can see all of the previous episodes up there as well. You get all the notes and everything on our website there. So thank you so much for tuning in. It's an honor to have this. And please Excuse me, it's an honor to have you with us, and please share this if it's helpful today. Uh, Thanks again. So we're going to dive into Jesus as bridegroom, king, and judge. If you've got a Bible with you, you you can flip to Matthew 25. I know a lot of you are probably listening while you're driving or doing a workout or taking a walk or whatever. I'm going to read some scripture to you today that I believe is vital for the church and the prayer movement to understand that we need to see Jesus rightly. Uh, One of the biggest hindrances to people worshiping and praying consistently and fervently is is not seeing God rightly. And, And this is having massive ramifications right now in the body of Christ. And so I want to lay these three things out quickly here. Uh, Hat tip to Mike Bickle. I did get some of this from him and I'm relaying it, but I've been looking at Matthew 25 and then I've been looking at what's happening in our culture. And I believe this actually speaks to what's going on right now. And throughout the book of Revelation, you see Jesus revealed in a distinct way as a bridegroom, as a king, and as a judge. And you see those same three facets of Jesus's nature and character revealed in the three parables that he told here in Matthew chapter 25. So let's just dive in and let's look at this. The first parable is the parable of the wise and the foolish virgin. So this one's a little bit more common in the prayer movement. We talk about how we need to get oil in our lamps. There's these virgins who five were wise and they had oil in their lamps and five were not. Uh, And they fell asleep. And at midnight, there was a cry that was heard. Uh, the bridegrooms here come out to meet him. And so those who had not gotten oil in their lamps were trying to get oil from the others who had gotten it. And, uh, and they responded, the wise said, this is Matthew 25, verse 9. Uh, they said, no, lest this should not be enough for us and you, but go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. That They had to get their own oil. And it says, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went into the wedding and the door was shut. And they came back and said, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he said, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, verse 13, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So Jesus says the issue with the five who did not have oil was they did not know him. They did not know him. So this oil is the oil of intimacy. It's the oil of knowing Jesus. Those five 
wise ones had invested the time in knowing Jesus. This is him revealing himself as a bridegroom. He's revealing himself as one who wants to know us and be close to us and love us. Jesus wants to have real relationship with us. He doesn't want us to just obey him from a distance. He wants us to come close to him. And he invites us in as a bridegroom who makes covenant with us, which he did by shedding his blood on the cross. And, and, he, and he offers us the bread and the wine as a sign of the covenant that he wants to make with us as we, as we say yes with our faith and we, we come into relationship with God through Jesus. We're actually, it's not just that we're putting our faith in him to be saved, but we're entering into a covenant to be married to him as the body of Christ, that we are collectively his bride and that he is uh, our bridegroom and he has gone away just like an, an engagement where a bride and bridegroom are engaged, when we, when we've become engaged in a sense, or betrothed is actually the biblical Jewish idea, betrothed to Jesus, he's gone away to prepare a place for us, and he's coming again to consummate what he began, and we'll be uh, married to him forever. He will be our husband, and we will be his, we'll be his wife in a sense, that we'll be in covenant with him and in love with him. Okay, and that may it may seem weird, especially maybe for guys to think of of ourselves as a bride, but it's not about anything weird, other than about uh, un opening up our hearts and being close to Jesus on the inside, in a spiritual way, in a personal way, not in a sensual way, but just in a personal way that our hearts are open and vulnerable and transparent, and that we're close to Jesus. Uh, that's his desire. We've got to get oil in our lamps. So Jesus is saying, I'm the bridegroom. You need to understand this. I'm coming again, and I'm going to finish what I started. And so what we, we need this revelation. The world needs this revelation. There's a breakdown in the understanding of marriage and family and covenant. And uh, and all of those things are related to the fact that, that we don't realize that marriage and, and family are designed to reflect who God actually is and Jesus as the bridegroom and us as the bride. That's what marriage is a picture of. So even that breakdown that's happened in our society in recent years and decades goes back to the fact that we don't know what marriage is really about, that it's really a picture of a greater reality that Jesus is our bridegroom and that we are his bride and that he has invited us into covenant with him to be in loving relationship with him for all of eternity. It's amazing. And so we have a responsibility in light of Jesus as the bridegroom to say yes. That's our that's our responsibility. We've got to get oil in our lamps. We've got to be spend time with him. We've got to pray. We've got to worship. We've got to be in the word of God. And we've got to really know him. Jesus is our bridegroom. Jesus is also revealed as the king. He is the king. So let's look at the next parable in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to him. One he gave five talents, another two, and to another one, each according to his own journey. So this is a parable about stewardship. It says that this man gives five to one, two to, to one, and one to the others. And so the one with five and the one with two, if you know the story, they took that talent, they invested it, and they gained more. But the one that only had one did not. He was nervous. Uh, but Jesus, Jesus comes in here. I'm trying to find the spot here. To the one who received one talent, Jesus said, or excuse me, the man said to Jesus, Lord, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. I was afraid, went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there have what is yours. So he went and hid his talent or his, his treasure, the talent isn't actually like a skill. It's, a, it's a actually money. It's, it's an investment. He says, I, I hid that talent into the ground, and I was afraid. But Jesus said, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. So you should have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back to my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent and give it to him who has ten talents. For everyone has... More will be given, and he will have with abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And, cast the un and he cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's pretty intense there. So Jesus is being revealed as the king. Okay, so, so you have to understand in a kingdom, it's not like what we have 
uh, it's like in America here where we have private property and it's a democracy of some sort uh, and, and the government is of the people by the people. That's not what it's like in a kingdom. And for God is not uh, the president of the kingdom of God. He's the king of the kingdom of God, which means everything actually belongs to him. Jesus as the king, he owns everything in a kingdom. Everyone other than the king and his the king's family are stewards of the king's resources. If you live in a kingdom, your land is not yours. It's actually the king's and he's allowing you to live on his land as part of his kingdom. And so it's a whole different mindset. And so Jesus is trying to get us to understand everything is actually the Lord's. Everything is God's and that we are just stewards. Everything that we have has been given to us by a sovereign God who loves us and is invited us to be a part of his kingdom. And so what we have is, is, uh, in our culture right now is we have rebellion and we have lawlessness. Uh, we have a, just a lack of responsibility. People want hand on one hand, they want handouts, <laughs> you know, they want somebody, they, they have uh, entitlement in their hearts. You know, they want handouts. They can, they might be lazy. And then you've got people that are, Uh, just rebellious and lawless and they're out in the streets, they're destroying things and they're burning things up that aren't theirs and they're ruining other people's lives. Just a, just a lack of understanding the responsibility and stewardship that all of us have being a part of God's family and being his sons and daughters being made by God, that he is the King and that we actually are to be responsible. So what, what's our response to, to God as King? So he's not just our savior, but he's, he's the King. He rules and he reigns. He has all authority and all power. We need to be good stewards. If we have anything, we know that it's because King Jesus has given us a measure of what is his, and he set it in our hands for right now. And so our time, our talent, and our treasure, these are the things God's given us that we can steward well. He's given us gifts. He's given us time. Uh, He's given us spiritual gifts. He's given us some measure of resources and finances. And and Jesus is coming right now and he's saying uh, that we need to be responsible. We don't need to be lazy. We need to to take what we have, even if it's a risk, but we need to invest it. We need to invest our time. We need to invest our talent. We need to invest our treasure into kingdom things, into eternal things. And, uh, and, and, And it brings a sense of, of gravity to everyday life. It, it, you know, we think about what we do with our money, what we do with our free time and our spare time and our hobbies. Those things have gravity to them. God is, is looking at what we're doing. It's not just like, okay, we, we've, we've, we've got the bridegroom thing. We're going to spend some time in prayer, read our Bibles and do some ministry, but then the rest of our lives are ours. We can kind of do what we want. He's saying, no, I want all of your life is mine. I am the king of your life. I'm your Lord, not just your savior. I'm actually uh, your ruler. And, uh, and that's why Jesus is called the king of kings and the Lord of lords, because he's giving us a, a responsibility in his kingdom uh, to steward his resources. And uh, he, he's inviting us to be good stewards, to take what we have, uh, and use them for his purposes and for eternal purposes. So Jesus is the king. Jesus is also revealed as the judge. Okay, so let's keep looking. Matthew 25, now we're down to verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory, and the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, It's the sheep and it's the goats. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty or give you drink or Uh, and skip down to verse 40. He says, the king will answer and say, inasmuch as you did to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did to me. So Jesus is is revealing himself as the judge at the end of the age. He's saying, uh, I'm going to right every wrong. I'm going to make everything that's wrong right. We need a revelation that God is just and that Jesus 
is a just judge. He is coming to judge the earth. And for the believer, that is good news. And for those who are not following Jesus, it is horrific news. And Jesus is perfect in his judgments. We don't need to be scared of judgment. We don't need to be scared of Jesus as judge. This is a good thing. His judgment is his decision about something. It's his view on something. He looks at something and he judges it and he decides what it's like. These are his decisions. So Jesus is a righteous judge. He's a perfect, loving, gracious, good judge, but he, he, abhors sin and evil, and he loves goodness and righteousness. And so Jesus judges perfectly, and we should want that. It's the judgment of God that 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 kissed with mercy on the cross of Jesus, and, and the, the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus on the cross so that if we are in Christ, we his judgment towards us is mercy. He looks at us and judges us as righteous because Jesus has already taken that. It would be unjust if God looked at a Christian who was trusting in Jesus and, and judged us and sent us to hell. That would be unjust. God cannot do it. It's his justice. It's his nature as a just God uh, that, that has locked in our salvation. Uh, through G- through our faith in Jesus Christ. So we want God to be just. He's not just going on a whim. Oh, well, I feel like forgiving you today, and I don't feel like forgiving you tomorrow. No, he's operating on a perfect scale of justice based on his very nature. And he looks at the cross, and he looks at us as Christians, and he says, you are forgiven, you are righteous because you are in Christ. That is good news for us. Judgment to us is good news because we stand before God covered in the righteousness of Jesus. Uh, and, and so, but what, what that means is, is, it's, is it's really not good news for those who are apart from Christ. And that's our, our what's called justification, right? We are justified in God's eyes. But we don't have a revelation that God is just, that he's going to deal with things. And, uh, and so what it causes is the injustices that we see all over the world. We need a revelation that God is just. Uh, it, you know, the, the fruit of the revelation of God being just is what we see here in Matthew 25, that we care for others, that it gives us a sense of compassion and love and a desire to serve and to help those that are in need. That's the fruit of a revelation that God is just as it gives us compassion. And so uh, when you see those who are caring for the poor, the downtrodden who are sowing their time and their money into those less fortunate, uh, and it doesn't have to be some kind of big charity project. It just means those that are nearest to you, that you actually care for them. Those who are in your community, in your church, in your neighborhood, that we're actually doing for one person what we wish we could do for everybody. That's what Jesus says. Um, you know, Heidi Baker says, stop for the one. And so Jesus is saying when we do that, we're actually, it's like we're caring for Jesus himself. When we care for those that are poor and those that are needy. And, uh, and we show that compassion and that mercy. You know, Micah 6, 8 says to, to love mercy, to do justly, and to walk humbly with our God. And that's our responsibility, knowing that Jesus is a judge. We go, wow, we need to walk humbly. We need to love mercy because we need it, right? Uh, and if we need it, uh, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, right? So we need it, and we need to show it to others, and we need to hate evil, and we need to love righteousness just like Jesus, the judge of the earth, does as well. So we need, our, we need to see this, and I can't get into it anymore right now just for the sake of time, but we need to see Jesus as bridegroom, king, and judge. And we can see that all throughout the book of Revelation. I encourage you to read through that book as well. It's fascinating the way that Jesus chooses to reveal himself related to the time of his return. And, uh, and I believe we're going to see these themes emerging in the church that's hungry for God and that's pursuing his heart right now in this season. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for those who are listening and watching today. God, I ask for a spirit of wisdom 
and revelation in the knowledge of you, would you open the eyes of our hearts to see you clearly, Jesus, that we would not just see a limited portion of you, but you would continue to unfold the multifaceted beauty of who you are, that your nature would be seen by our hearts, God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to see you. And specifically, I pray, help us to see you as a bridegroom who is in covenant with us, who is passionately pursuing your bride with love and desire. Help us to see you as the king, as the good steward, as the one who rules and reigns over the earth. Help us to see you as a judge who is righteous in all of his ways, who is compassionate and merciful, but confronts evil and does not let things slip by. But God, you are a good judge and all of your judgments are true and right. And we honor you, Jesus. Continue to reveal yourself to us in your name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on the Presence Pioneers podcast. If this was helpful to you or you think it'd be helpful to others, please share this with your friends, family on social media and help us to spread this word. And again, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe so you can stay tuned for more Bible teachings and interviews with leaders from the worship and prayer movement. Don't forget God's presence changes everything.